okay uh, so again uh, welcome to uh, another week uh, of this uh, nptel live session for technologies for clean and renewable energy production by professor prasenjit mandal from iit roorkee and i'm hari shankar i'm a phd scholar from iit madras so i'll be handling this session uh, every sunday uh, from uh, 3 pm in the afternoon so just a quick introduction uh, i think uh, we have some uh, new faces today uh, uh, people are still joining okay yeah so yeah exactly uh, what i what i wanted to uh, say is uh, how i'll be handling uh, these sessions um basically what i'll be doing is i'll just uh, run through the uh, nptel uh, lectures that uh, professor mandal has taken uh, during uh, his uh, nptel course and i i won't be like going into detail as such per se because uh, what i intend with this course is that this is just a supplement to the uh, real nptel course that professor mandal uh, is taking so i expect uh, everyone to watch those videos and this uh, live session is basically just uh, you know supposed to act as a supplement so if you guys have any doubts uh, regarding any particular topic or any particular questions from the assignments and so on so that is the purpose of uh, this uh, live session uh, that is happening every day and yes uh, there will be uh, two people uh, taking these uh, live sessions so one is myself uh, i'll be taking from 3 pm and then the next session uh, will be taken by one of my uh, colleagues uh, mr debarun and he'll be uh, taking uh, another uh, session from 5:00 uh, so you can join either uh, one of these as per your convenience and if you want you can join both of them if you are uh, inter interested as well so yes so that is the point i want to stress because uh, i don't want people to think this is the uh, main nptel course or anything this is uh, again just a supplement to the uh, main nptel course uh, that prosom model is taking so uh, today also what i'll be doing is i'll just run through the uh, ppt that uh, prosom mandal has uh, taken for the week 2 of his uh, nptel uh, course uh, technologies for clean and renewable energy production and maybe we can solve a couple of uh, questions from previous year assignments not uh, this year assignments so this will be similar to your assignment that you have to submit i think so uh, we'll be uh, solving some previous year questions uh, based on the previous year assignments and everything and uh, from then on we'll see uh, how it goes but the major uh, objective of uh, this course is that uh, hopefully you guys start coming up uh, with the questions so if you guys let me know uh, whether you want to discuss any of uh, you know the uh, lectures or any particular sections of uh, the uh, course or if you guys have any uh, doubts with respect to any questions so uh, hopefully you guys will bring it up and in the uh, consecutive session uh, we uh, will be able to discuss that as well anyways uh, let's move uh, with the uh, today's session yeah so uh, just uh, confirming uh, any uh, doubts from uh, last week's uh, course or like this uh, last week's uh, session if anyone has any doubts uh, you can always uh, unmute and unmute and speak yourself uh, or uh, you know you can always uh, use the chat box as well to type whether you have any doubts so yes fine um yeah so regarding today's uh, session so just uh, briefing uh, what happened uh, last week so last week we are basically looking into the energy scenario of both india as well as the world so and uh, we were looking into the different uh, sources of uh, these uh, energies whether it's from uh, petroleum source so it can be you know non renewable something like a petroleum based source or it could be renewable something like solar wind etc and in the non renewable source we were mainly looking into something called as coal 
uh, we were looking into the properties of uh, cold, the various analysis we can do to evaluate the uh, quality of cold. And we also uh, looked into uh, certain uh, methods of uh, you know, using coal as a fuel, basically something like a combustion uh, of coal. So today also we will be uh, continuing with this uh, topic. Uh, we will start from this topic, uh, combustion of coal, and we will briefly move into gasification of coal and followed by liquefaction of coal uh, for today's uh, session. So this is uh, again uh, one scheme of uh, uh, selective catalytic, uh, you know, combustion. So what happens is you have a uh, coal here. You will be uh, putting this coal inside a mill, which will break down this coal into usually or pulverize uh, this coal into powder-like structures, and this will be entering a mill. Uh, I'm um, not a mill, a furnace, where uh, you know you pass air and you uh, combust the uh, coal and the flue gases come out of the top and you know you have all these uh, cleaning um, or scrubbing process basically to remove suspended particles uh, nitrogen and sulfur oxide emissions ash removal and so on and so on and usually this will be used to produce uh, you know electricity basically Or, uh, or, uh, or in uh, basically here. Yeah. So after all these uh, scrub and everything, you get CO2, which is the main product of combustion. Right. So <clears throat> just uh, you know, again as I said, uh, just uh, we'll be just briefing through all these process. But yeah, this is basically the same as what we have been uh, looking in. Uh, for the previous combustors as well. So basically you have, uh, I think uh, last class we learned uh, different cycles of uh, this combustion. So uh, different thermodynamic cycles basically. We had a topping cycle, we had a bottoming cycle and we had a combined cycle. So basically this is also uh, one of uh, these uh, schemes so what we are here uh, we are trying to achieve is the cleaning of uh, carbon dioxide so this uh, you know so this scr is basically selective catalytic reactor and you have uh, something uh, for controlling so this selective catalytic reactor will control the amount of no uh, nox emissions or nitrogen oxide emissions and then you have you know fgd which is a flue gas scrubber, basically a kind of scrubber basically which will control your uh, sulfur oxide emissions and you will be able to remove ash from here and basically clean CO2 will come out of the process. And this uh, CO2 can be used either as either to, you know, for any chemical process or we can even use it for, uh, you know, producing electricity in a turbine. So, before we use coal, internet, second. Just a moment. Uh, I think uh, some issue. Internet. Okay, uh, so yeah, before uh, we uh, you know usually uh, use this coal for any kind of process, we usually uh, subject this coal to a couple of pretreatment process. So mainly something like the desulfurization, which is uh, removal of sulfur, and demineralization, which is basically removal of all the inorganic metal or minerals, basically.
so sulfur in coal is usually present in the form of uh, pyrite or uh, you know iron sulfide uh, form or uh, or also uh, it can be found in organic sulfur form and then usually uh, you can sometimes uh, you can also find the sulfur in the form of zinc sulfide or uh, lead sulfide but mostly it will be in the form of fes2 yeah i mean even though the uh, uh, fes2 uh, the, you have two fes2 here so one is the pyrite form and the other is the marcasite form so basically there are some uh, chemical or uh, crystal structure difference between these uh, FeS2s of uh, pyrite as well as uh, marcasite, but again uh, these are basically iron ores of uh, sulfur, and the sulfur can be removed by chemical, physical, or biological methods. So, uh, in terms of physical, so basically in physical method there will be no uh, involvement of chemical reactions. It will be usually uh, something uh, using like an unit operation kind of uh, thing. So, for example. Jigging, uh, you know, tabling, dense medium processing, hydrocloning, air classification. So basically, these are just physical process. So, for example, in jigging, you will be uh, having a tank where you will be uh, having water, and inside this, you will be having the cold powder, and then you will uh, send in pulses, pulse uh, force, which will uh, separate uh, these, uh, you know, inorganics uh, from the cold. So basically, as I said, again, no chemical reactions will be involved in this process. It will be usually uh, physical in nature. But then, in uh, chemical uh, methods of uh, processing, you will have something like an oxy desulfurization process, which uh, employs oxygen or air in aqueous solution at high temperatures and pressures. And uh, then you have something like a hydro desulfurization. So this is a reductive process which uses hydrogen. to remove sulfur mostly in the form of hydrogen sulfide and then you have something like a caustic treatment which is usually uh, you know sodium hydroxide uh, treatment or any other uh, uh, sodium salt uh, solution treatment so these are chemical process and then uh, you have a biological process bio desulfurization basically uh, so these uses microbes or bacterial cultures to oxidize the fes2 that is uh, present or the pyrite that is present in the uh, sulfur coal and then you can remove this uh, oxidized uh, uh, pyrite from the coals or thus you can remove the sulfur from the coals so basically we use uh, microbes or bacteria for uh, achieving the uh, biological uh, separation pre treatment process so basically uh, in all these process you usually have two types of reactors fluidized bed reactor as well as fixed bed reactor so a fixed bed reactor is basically uh, you know something like this here the packing will be fixed and you'll have a flow through this packing but then uh, let's say if this packing is not like rigid and you know if if we keep increasing this velocity of uh, whatever gas we are passing through this reactor eventually it will reach a phase where eventually it will reach a phase where this particles will somehow get suspended or fluidized in the bed so basically the force from the uh, you know uh, gas that we are passing through will be equivalent to the gravity that is acting on the uh, particles so that means this particles are now suspended or fluidized in the bed or the uh, reactor so this case is the fluidized reactor and if no such thing happens and these particles are rigid in nature and there are no uh, the, there is no movement between the particles it, it is usually fixed bed reactor just like a very uh, you know simple explanation of this uh, fixed bed as well as uh, fluidized bed so fluidized bed provides more contact so that is the advantage of uh, fluidized bed basically so it provides more contact between the cold particles and air 
thus giving the uh, process more efficiency and you know it also helps to add some in situ metal oxide for sulfur capture uh, which can eventually reduce the pollution that is caused by uh, you know processing the coal and you can also recycle unburnt coal in the fluidized bed reactor which again increases the conversion efficiency and uh, the other uh, th uh, thing about fluidized bed is that you require smaller size particle that can be operated in a fluidized bed compared to a fixed bed so these are just some of the uh, advantages of fluidized bed reactor and this is just uh, a 3d or not uh, 3d but like a representation of fluidized bed reactor so this is so this is our uh, fluidized bed reactor basically so you have coke uh, that is coming from here which will be uh, usually uh, in a very uh, small particle size or pulverized form and this will enter the fluidized bed reactor for a boiler which our uh, process we are uh, using and again uh, the every, everything else is pretty much what we have been uh, you know looking at so far so we'll be having a scrubbers here we'll be having an economizer or an air preheater so basically we have been looking into a lot of these uh, process before the only difference between the previous ones and this one is that we are using a fluidized bed reactor where these particles will be you know suspended because the air that is coming up will be of high velocities and this velocity at which we can suspend or fluidize the bed is called fluidization velocity so yeah so in the fluidized bed uh, your uh, combustion will happen and this will pass through a cyclone where you separate out all the unburnt uh, particles of coal so you can see these black dots here this will come back into the reactor and the flue gases will go through the top of the cyclone and uh, again uh, you'll uh, you know pass it through different kinds of scrubbers to remove all the uh, impurities and everything and finally you you will get your main product so one more thing uh, we looked at uh, in the last uh, class is that uh, you know you can operate uh, this uh, process in two uh, operating conditions one is subcritical which is uh, you know less than 373 degrees celsius and less than 220 bars pressure and then supercritical which means it is greater than 373 degrees celsius which is greater than uh, 373 degrees celsius and greater than 220 bars and usually when it comes to emissions supercritical um, process usually have lesser emissions uh, sorry supercritical uh, conditions will have lesser emissions compared to subcritical uh, you know operation and then you have uh, you know if you keep on increasing this temperature yeah if you keep on increasing this uh, temperature so this is a uh, 1050 fahrenheit or uh, you know basically 565 degree, up to 565 degrees celsius and if you keep on increasing this temperature to greater than 600 degrees celsius it will be advanced to supercritical condition and then greater than 760 it will be ultra supercritical so what you can see from this is that as you keep on increasing the operating temperature and pressure the net energy efficiency keeps on increasing so from 35 you go to 37 at supercritical and then 42 and 44 at advanced and ultra supercritical conditions and the heating rate um, you know if we keep on increasing this uh, you know pressure and temperature the heating rate decreases as we move on with the higher operating conditions
so these are the uh, basic differences between operating at subcritical and supercritical conditions right so just uh, take a look at these uh, questions um see if you can guess some of these answers so most of these questions uh, are usually uh, straightforward in nature uh, like mostly uh, based on theory maybe sometimes uh, you can expect some uh, simple numerical questions as well for i think uh, your current assignments are also in this format so just uh, see if you can uh, guess the answers from whatever we just saw uh, in the last few slides and in a couple of minutes i uh, will uh, see how how these are uh, you know what are the answers for these uh, questions okay so the first question which of these forms of sulfur is present in wood um any uh, guesses okay so the answer is all of these so we have uh, fps2 in both pyrite as well as the marcasite form we have organic sulfur as such we have uh, zinc sulfide as well as lead sulfide so all of these is the right answer and the next question why fluidized bed gives relatively higher efficiency so the answer here any guesses so we yeah both a and b is the right answer because because it uh, it provides more contact between the particles and air as well as we can recycle the unburnt coal which increases the conversion so both a and b is the answer then the net energy efficiency of ultra supercritical boilers so ultra is the uh, maximum yes uh, the maximum uh, Uh, you know super critical condition that we have uh, studied so far so whatever maximum efficiency we get will be the ultra super critical boilers uh, energy efficiency and uh, higher heating value so the answer here yes uh, someone said it right it is 44% and 7757 btu per kilowatt hour right fine let's uh, move on so yeah this is uh, another uh, you know topic something called as chemical looping combustion so basically in chemical looping con combustion there is a chemical in the form of a metal or metal oxide and that uh, you know metal or metal oxide is termed as oxygen carrier that completes a cyclic loop between two reactors present in the process and helps in the combustion of the fuel so this pr process avoids direct contact between fuel and air this method of burning carbon based fuels is blessed with inherent separation of carbon dioxide and this separation 
does not require any extra energy so just uh, asking you guys have you guys uh, like uh, gone through this uh, lecture for chemical looping combustion yeah, anyone want to like volunteer and explain what you have understood from the lectures Fine. Yeah, sure, sure. Right. So basically, in very uh, simple terms, so this fuel, it could be something like coal, mostly. This coal, yeah, let it be there. So as uh, the process said, we have a metal. This metal will be oxidized into a metal oxide, and this oxidization is a you know heat generating process so because uh, this is this process oxidization process generates heat when we pass air through or exchange air through this uh, you know system the air also gets heated so we get hot air out of this oxidation process and if we combine this hot air and fuel and uh, send it to the reduction reactor we'll, we we can combust or gasify this coal to produce carbon dioxide and water right so yeah again we will take a detailed look into the uh, uh, you know reactions that are involved in this uh, system so the first reaction is the oxidization of metal to metal oxide so 2 me me basically means metal uh, that that has been used uh, for this chemical looping combustion so this metal will first get oxidized to metal oxide and this happens at an elevated temperature around 700 to 900 degrees celsius yeah basically this is an exothermic reaction and this metal oxide is then separated from the nitrogen and transported to the fuel or the reducer which is the this reactor basically reducer or oxidizer so as i said because this how does the heating process happen yeah basically like this so what happens is we'll pass this metal to oxygen at 700 to 900 degree celsius right and at this condition this metal will uh, you know get converted to metal oxide this metal to metal oxide conversion will release some energy or in the uh, uh, energy or heat basically because this is an exothermic reaction so this heat is what is being used by the reducer reactor this part this reactor where you pass fuel inside and because you are getting heat from this you can combust this fuel in the presence of oxygen or air so we are passing air also here so because of uh, the high temperature that you are getting from this oxidation process as well as you are passing air through it this coal will get combusted to form carbon dioxide and water so basically you will get heat from this oxidization reactor i mean uh, reaction the, the oxidation of uh, metal uh, to metal oxide uh, reaction right yeah so again so this metal oxide then reacts with the hydrocarbon fuel basically the uh, coal around 900 degrees celsius to produce carbon dioxide and water and when this process happens the metal oxide will also simultaneously gets reduced to metal so if you see in this picture first your uh, metal oxide goes through an oxidation cycle where it is getting oxidized to metal oxide and then when it passes through the reducing cycle of the reducing reactor your coal gets converted to carbon dioxide and water but then your metal oxide gets converted back into its metal form so that is the whole process of uh, this chemical looping combustion so now we are again back to this metal form now this metal form again you can oxidize it back to the metal oxide at uh, 700 degrees celsius 
and this metal oxide will again pass through this uh, reduction cycle to uh, you know uh, convert your uh, coal to uh, carbon dioxide or uh, and water so thus thus this uh, cycle continues so this process is called as uh, chemical looping combustion so how does this metal oxide convert uh, our uh, fuel or coal to uh, this uh, you know carbon dioxide and water so these two reactions will give you an idea so we have two metal oxide reacting with a mole of carbon to give us carbon dioxide and the metal back again the same metal oxide can react with hydrogen to form metal and water right so this metal can anything like uh, you know iron aluminum or nickel so these two reactions uh, if you just uh, look at these two reactions uh, are basically the three reactions you you may get an idea so first we had this metal which got uh, oxidized to metal oxide in this uh, oxidation uh, chamber then this oxidized metal oxide now reacts with carbon and hydrogen present in our uh, fuel to produce carbon dioxide and water along with the metal back in the reducing chamber now we can continue this cycle like that and this process is called as chemical looping combustion now the amount of oxygen that we are supplying for each of these process will determine what are the products that we get out of this process so for example the first uh, process combustion we usually have to produce uh, supply huge amounts of oxygen or excess amounts of oxygen so if we look at the oxygen to coal uh, ratio in uh, weight by weight format or simple terms it is uh, represented as r so r basically means weight of uh, oxygen by weight of coal so if we look at this ratio for combustion this r ratio is greater than 2.5 and your major products are oxygen because you are passing excess amount of oxygen uh, that is uh, more than uh, what is sociometrically sociometrically required so oxygen will also be a part of the product then you have completely oxidized products like carbon dioxide and water but then if we look at other process like gasification your r ratio or the ratio to oxygen and coal will be less less than what is uh, you know stoichiometrically uh, required for complete oxidation so it will it will fall usually within the range of 0.68 to 2.5 so because it is uh, you know somewhat less than uh, what is the stoichiometric requirement for complete oxidation you can get some partial oxidation compounds like for example carbon dioxide and hydrogen and of course some amount of this can also get completely oxidized and you will also get water and carbon dioxide so these are the major composition of products from gasification reaction and when it comes to pyrolysis we usually try to operate it in an inert atmosphere so the ratio of oxygen to coal or r will be less than 0.68 it can even be you know close to zero sometimes if you want to like uh, operate uh, at completely inert atmosphere so in these cases you will usually get you know uh, you usually won't get any completely oxidized products so the major products could be carbon or basically coke or a char which is basically uh, consisting of carbon elemental carbon then you will have carbon monoxide and hydrogen and if you uh, come if you operate it at uh, near the uh, ratio 0 uh, or r ratio 0 you will usually get a liquid fuel so uh, if someone has learned pyrolysis so now the new uh, yeah, research topic is something like biomass pyrolysis or plastic pyrolysis where you pyrolyze these uh, waste biomass or plastics to produce oil and this oil can be used for fuel applications so this is uh, like a very uh, 
uh, a significant amount of research has been going on uh, in this pyrolysis field for the even from uh, you know last uh, 10 15 or even 20 years so yeah Okay, so these are just some of the uh, reactions that are associated with cold gasification. So, uh, so, uh, so far we learned about combustion. So, combustion basically means complete oxidation. So, all your products that you get from, uh, so we can even this last slide we saw, all the products that we get from the uh, Combustion process or combustion process are completely oxidized ones uh, like water and carbon dioxide. But in terms of gasification, it is partial oxidation. And we will get uh, partially oxidized compounds like uh, you know carbon monoxide or hydrogen. So that is the difference between combustion and uh, you know gasification. So even if you look at these uh, reactions that are associated with combustion and gasification, you can see. So gasification with oxygen will happen only at, you know, half uh, moles of oxygen per mole of carbon, uh, carbon, and you will get the product, you know, carbon monoxide. And combustion with oxygen will happen uh, in stoichiometric manner. So one C plus one O two will give you one CO two. So yeah, these are just uh, different kinds of reactions. So you have a C plus uh, CO2 giving, uh, you know, two carbon monoxide or C plus water gasification with steam gives you carbon monoxide plus hydrogen or you can even perform gasification with hydrogen. So C plus uh, two moles of hydrogen will give you a, a mole of methane. And then you have something like a water gas ship gas in a reaction where carbon monoxide will react with water or steam to produce hydrogen and carbon dioxide and then the last uh, reaction is methanation reaction where carbon dioxide gets methanated using hydrogen to form methane and water. So based on uh, the uh, you know uh, our gasification prod uh, products or the based on the composition of the products we can classify the gases or gas products into two syngas and producer gas. So each of these gases usually have different compositions basically. So in, in terms of uh, syngas, you will have 20 to 30 percent hydrogen along with 40 to 60 percent of carbon, carbon, carbon monoxide and uh, 5 to 15 percentage of carbon dioxide and very trace amount less than 5 percent of methane. And you usually won't have any heavier hydrocarbons and uh, you know some in some cases you can even have nitrogen and water vapor in the syn gas when it comes to producer gas it usually has much lesser carbon carbon monoxide so here uh, in syn gas it, uh, we had like 60 almost 60 percent carbon monoxide but in producer gas you usually have only uh, 20 to 22 percent of uh, carbon monoxide and the hydrogen content is also lesser so 13 to 19 percent for producer gas compared to 20 to 30 percent but then the nitrogen will be abundant in the air producer gas. So because of this, if you look at the calorific value of uh, these two gases, syn gas usually have a higher calorific value compared to producer gas. So you also have, a, a, you know, Gas, a uh, few gasification uh, schemes to produce syngas. So your feedstock, which is basically coal, you can first heat it initially, and when you heat it initially, you can separate out the volatiles. Of uh, so, uh, in the last class, uh, we uh, learned about the proximate uh, analysis of uh, our coal. So we had, uh, you know, in a typical coal, we have moisture which is basically uh, water then volatile components which basically uh, get volatilized when we heat our coal and then we had fixed carbon and ash. So when we heat our coal we can get two parts so when it comes to volatiles 
so we have one volatile form and a non volatile char so we can come we can gasify whatever is uh, volatile getting volatilized from the coal to produce uh, syngas or we can gasify the char which is non volatile in nature we can gasify that char to produce syngas so each of these uh, different uh, two different routes have their own uh, uh, stoichiometric uh, requirement of oxygen and their own stoichiometric uh, reaction uh, formula so for gas gasification of volatiles this is the formula that we use which is C, cn hm plus half n o2 gives half m h2 plus n co so again here you can see we have n moles of c but then we are only using half of n of o2 which means we this this gasification uh, again is basically a partial oxidation process we are not supplying the entire amount of o2 that is required and similarly you also have uh, a formula for char where it is chx oy plus 1 minus y h2 o giving x by 2 plus 1 minus y h2 plus co so just different notations basically we are using n and m in the uh, volatiles case and h and uh, i mean x and y for the uh, gasification phase so this is just a stoichiometric uh, reaction uh, that we can write for gasification of char as well as volatiles and then uh, professor mandel talked about uh, the production efficiency of uh, syngas so syngas production can be determined if air flow rate feeding rate and composition of the syngas is known and if a coal is composed of carbon and hydrogen only then the major products from syngas are carbon monoxide carbon dioxide hydrogen methane and in some cases ethane then if that is the case then we can find the fuel gas production in in this unit nm cube plus uh, nm cube by per kilogram using this formula right so let's let's say there is no ethane in this uh, system so this ethane is zero then that means you don't have to uh, this ethane in this formula will also become zero right yes yes uh, yeah basically basically this is just uh, a balance yes definitely but uh, yeah i didn't like look into the uh, definition i mean uh, the derivation of these formulas per se because as i said i was just planning to just uh, run through these uh, uh, equations and uh, the slides but definitely if you are interested i can uh, put up a derivation and we can uh, we can see how this formula gets derived uh, in the uh, next class uh, if uh, you want shall i uh, make a note of it yeah sure okay right fine so yeah uh, this derivation we'll uh, definitely uh, see how we can derive uh, this uh, formula and then but again as uh, as you mentioned this is usually just a balance whatever air flow rate that we have uh, you know we apply a lot of this nitrogen balance and all all those uh, things but yeah definitely we'll look into it in detail okay okay so yeah. the energy efficiency of the process or coal gas efficiency is defined as the ratio of lhv or lower heating value of coal gas to the lower heating value of the coal treated incremented by the added energy or electric or fuel for the allotment processes per kilogram of coal so this is uh, energy efficiency eta 
which is basically the ratio of the product of uh, LHV or lower heating value of coal uh, into fuel gas production by lower heating value of coal treated plus a, a term which uh, you know yeah which basically includes the amount of uh, electric energy or fuel energy that is being used per kg of uh, you know your uh, coal so this takes into account the energy that is required for this uh, you know process this term so this term uh, takes into account uh, with, so sometimes you can heat uh, produce heat using electricity or sometimes you'll be using some other uh, fuel for example wood or some some other uh, fuel to produce energy so this term basically it takes uh, that into account and based on all these uh, terms you can find the energy efficiency of the syngas production process eta and generally the conversion efficiency of thermal power plant is between 30 to 40 percent for a single cycle steam power plant and it can be up to 60 percent for a combined cycle gas turbine power plant. Um, yes, uh, Mr. Chaitanya. Yes, 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 basically, yes. So, yeah, sure. Yeah, so again, uh, the conversion efficiency of uh, the thermal uh, power plant can be between 30 to 40 percent for a single uh, cycle uh, steam power plant. And it can, if you use a combined cycle uh, gas turbine power plant, which is basically multi cycle uh, gas turbine, so these are just different types of uh, you know uh, uh, gas cycles that you can use in a thermal power plant, and, and the more uh, you know. Uh, cycles that you are using for the steam, the more or the gas turbine, the more efficiency you can get. So for a single uh, cycle, 30 to 40 percent is the average number, and uh, the more, the if you increase this uh, cycle uh, number, uh, or if you, uh, yeah, it can go up to even uh, 60 percent. Ah yes. Uh, so usually the uh, gas from syngas will uh, undergo a lot of uh, scrubbing and heat exchange process. So uh, like you can say the outlet of uh, the syngas is uh, in you know your uh, normal uh, not room temperature per se but not in the uh, hot condition. You can say it like that because uh, you usually exchange the heat um, fr uh, from the incoming hot gas to the uh, air that you want to pass uh, inside again. So a lot of these heat exchange happens. So maybe because of that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, this uh, not just in syn gas, any uh, you know gasification products, any gas products, you can uh, sometimes it it gets called as uh, cold gas. Yes. Right. So, uh, yeah, um, just a few questions based on uh, the previous year assignment. In chemical looping combustion, at what elevated temperature metal reacts with oxygen in the air in an exothermic reaction state to produce the metal oxide? And uh, based on the, uh, you know, uh, slides that we saw, it is between 700 and 900. And then syngas can be used for various applications including liquid fuels such as diesel and gasoline produced through dash. And the options are fischer tropsch synthesis. Okay, I think this question is based on liquefaction of uh, or applications of syngas. But anyways, uh, we'll just see what the answer is. Uh, I think uh, we have not uh, yet covered this application of syngas process yet. But anyways, uh, the uh, answer is fischer tropsch uh, synthesis. We'll uh, just look into what is uh, fischer tropsch synthesis in the uh, uh, coming uh, days. 
uh, syngas conversion efficiency of a thermal power plant is between dash and dash percent for a single cycle steam power plant and uh, we just had the discussion for that it will be between 30 and 40 percent so advantages of uh, gasification so gasification uh, we can uh, produce reduced amounts of carbon dioxide um, usually the footprint uh, when sometimes it is even car called as carbon footprint so the uh, footprint of uh, gasification process uh, is usually small compared to other process we can also control uh, the temperature and pressure uh, more uh, accurately meaning we can have a more accurate uh, control over the combustion of gasification uh, that we are doing and then we also can achieve a high thermal efficiency through gasification process so these are the four advantages of uh, gasification process and this is just uh, a brief summary of uh, how gasification can be used uh, from for uh, gasification of coal for different purposes so coal uh, gets gasified in a gasifier and it goes through a lot of uh, cleanup so for example uh, this in gas uh, can be cleaned up for uh, residues uh, sulfur uh, contents in the gas and so on and usually uh, the uses of uh, this sin gas it can be to produce electricity or electric power or it can be uh, un uh, it can undergo a variety of reactions to produce uh, liquid fuels basically this liquid uh, fuels we can produce uh, via fischer tropsch synthesis uh, or uh, even chemicals or it can uh, uh, yeah so this uh, electric power can be produced either through fuel cell or using a gas turbine so gas turbine electrical power or we can use this uh, hot air as a boiler so you can uh, uh, i mean uh, a boiler fuel basically so if you pass this hot air uh, through a boiler you can boil whatever uh, you want whether it is water or uh, if you want to produce steam uh, something like that so you can produce hot air steam etc using this uh, syn gas and uh, you know the by product of this is uh, the blue gas which is usually uh, carbon dioxide carbon monoxide etc or again uh, you can uh, produce this steam use this steam to run a steam turbine engine again to produce electrical power so basically there are only uh, you know two main uses of uh, the syn gas one is the uh, electricity or energy generation and other is fuels and chemicals and this flow chart is just showing the different uh, methods or different uh, schematics by which we can uh, arrive at this uh, uh, applications and then uh, we are uh, moving into the next process which is the direct uh, liquefaction of uh, coal so basically what this pro uh, process uh, does is you know this process acts hydrogen to the hydrogen deficient organic structure of coal by breaking it down only as far as necessary to produce distillable fuels so basically in uh, combustion and gasification our main main product was uh, gases here what we do is we pass hydrogen and essentially just heat uh, our coal to produce distillable liquids or liquid fuels basically so liquid fuels are the major products from uh, liquefaction uh, process so usually this is accomplished under a temperature of 400 degrees celsius and usually uh, high uh, pressures are also uh, used somewhere around 102 to uh, 204 uh, atmospheric pressure in a hydrogen environment so we will be using hydrogen so in uh, gasification and combustion we were using air here we will be using uh, hydrogen so we don't want uh, oxidation or gasification process to happen here so we usually uh, perform this in an inert atmosphere and mostly uh, we will be using hydrogen uh, you know for our liquefaction process so the coal fragments are further hydro cracked to produce synthetic crude oil which then undergo refinery upgrading so yes basically as i said uh, this distillable liquids 
uh, you know you can uh, just further process it uh, as you process a crude oil in a petroleum refinery uh, so and also in some cases you might uh, require further upgradation of this liquid fuels so you have coal you have this uh, uh, you can get this liquid fuels from liquefaction and let's say if it has a lot of uh, you know sulfur uh, compounds or nitrogen compounds in this liquid fuel you usually have to uh, you know further process process it something like you know hydro treating so you know hydro treating to produce acceptable trans transportation fuels so we'll probably have to remove uh, sulfur nitrogen oxygen and so on these kind of uh, hetero atoms from these liquid fuels produced and we usually use hydro treating to do that so just uh, the schematic so we have these three different kinds of coal lignite sub bituminous and bituminous coal we use hydrogen to produce uh, to hydrogenate or liquefy this uh, coal to produce this coal liquid uh, uh, which has a, a calorific value of 10000 kilocalories per kilogram and we can uh, just further uh, process it like how we process crude oil so how we process crude oil we basically just distill the crude oil based on uh, the boiling ranges and based on boiling ranges we can get gas oil which is basically diesel uh, gasoline which is basically petrol and kerosene right and these are just uh, different types of uh, uh, you know coal liquefaction process so in direct coal liquefaction you can either have a single stage uh, liquefaction or a double stage liquefaction process and in single stage uh, again you have a different uh, variety of process uh, for each of the for details on each of these process i would uh, suggest you to uh, just refer uh, the uh, lectures from uh, professor mandel so he he goes into a bit more detail uh, into these uh, different uh, process for uh, this uh, liquefaction uh, different kinds of liquefaction so the first one is uh, solvent refined coal liquefaction then you have something like an exxon donor solvent uh, liquefaction or h coal which means uh, we use uh, something like a hydrogen on a cobalt molybdenum catalyst and then you uh, look at, if you look at the double stage liquefaction process you have the two integrated two stage liquefaction process which is itsl process or catalytic multi stage liquefaction process which is the cmsl process so this is just uh, what uh, professor mandel was uh, explaining with regards to uh, the ctsl project or uh, you know the catalytic uh, two stage process so in the cmsl if the number of stages are two it is basically ctsl uh, catalytic catalytic two stage process so here you will we'll be using nickel molybdenum as our catalyst nickel molybdenum on alumina and we'll be uh, having two stages here so the first stage we'll be providing a, a temperature of uh, 400 degrees and in second stage a uh, further uh, increase in the heat up to 440 degrees celsius and again our objective here is to liquefy the coal to produce the uh, you know liquid fuels and when it comes to pressure yeah again pressure uh, you know high pressure 200 uh, bar pressure is uh, actually being used so ctsl process produces liquid product with low hetero atom concentration and high hydrogen to carbon ratio so this product is basically closer to petroleum too. so that uh, so you know uh, two stage process so they they even gave a reason why they are they are using a lower temperature uh, at the first stage and a higher temperature at the second stage so the lower temperature at the first stage provides better overall management of the hydrogen consumption and reduced hydrocarbon gas yield right so by uh, you know operating it in two stages and by slowly increasing the temperature so the first stage you are having only 400 and the second stage you are having uh, you know a comparatively higher temperature you are effectively what you are doing is you are effect you are not wasting any hydrogen because uh, if you provide a very high temperature at the first stage itself 
there are chances of uh, uh, you know hydrocarbon gases being formed for example something like ethane propane and so on so by effectively using two stages and slowly increasing the heat from temperature uh, stage 1 to stage 2 you are conserving hydrogen by eliminating the formation of these hydrocarbon gases like ethane and propane so that is the big advantage of uh, this uh, ctsl process and uh, the other advantage is that you know we have a very low heteroatom content and a very high hydrocarbon hydro uh, hydrogen is to carbon ratio so this uh, product again uh, can be uh, comparable to that of uh, petroleum crude then of course uh, like any other process even liquefaction has its own uh, challenges the first one being the uh, uncertainty in uh, oil prices around the world so this process is viable only when the crude oil price is high so if the crude oil price is higher than 70 or 80 dollars per barrel then performing this cold liquefaction makes sense so if the crude oil price is crashed and let's say it went less than 40 or uh, 35 us dollars then this cold liquefaction does not uh, make sense in an economic uh, sense so that is why the world uh, the oil prices uh, play a huge uh, part in whether uh, uh, you know uh, deciding the uh, liquefaction of coal is viable or not and then uh, this liquefaction uh, also requires high capital cost uh, in terms of equipments infrastructure and so on so that is uh, one thing and then investment risk risk so there is no given because there is uncertainty in the oil price and uh, we uh, we are uh, we can't say you know if we produce uh, this uh, liquid fuel from coal liquefaction we can definitely make x amount of profit uh, and so on there is definitely an investment risk because uh, again there you have to invest a huge amount of capital and your returns uh, basically depends on the price of uh, you know the crude oil around the world so there is a huge investment risk that is uh, involved in liquefaction charge, uh, liquefaction uh, process so these three are the economic challenges uh, for uh, liquefaction then of course uh, there is uh, a, there are a few technical challenges as well so the first technology is commercialized in china in 2008 and this uh, first technology that was commercialized in china was found during uh, second world war so need other first kind of large scale operation with carbon management to verify baselines and economics so basically this process or this technology is kind of outdated because this was found uh, in what some 70 years uh, before now so using this process to perform economic and uh, economic analysis and uh, emission analysis is kind of outdated so we would require uh, newer uh, technologies to emerge in order to make sure this uh, this uh, process can uh, you know can be viable in terms of both uh, economics as well as its uh, sustainability so the technological uh, factor is uh, one thing then uh, the other uh, suggestion is that r and d activity of uh, liquefaction should focus on remaining process issues such as further improvement in efficiency product cost quality reliability of materials and components and data needed to better define carbon life cycle so i hope you understood uh, what uh, this session was basically uh, you know there is much more research that is uh, needed in these areas to improve the efficiency of liquefaction to bring down the product cost uh, and improve the quality and you know even uh, uh, when it comes to sustainability we have to better uh, you know define and uh, demonstrate a better life cycle for carbon so that is uh, one thing with, when it comes to the R&D for uh, liquefaction uh, process. And then hybrid technology also needs to be developed to in, uh, demonstrate integrated demonstration. Okay. <clears throat> so some new research areas that is being conducted in this regard basically this hybrid technology is to combine solar as well as liquefaction. So instead of uh, using uh, electricity or uh, any other fuel to uh, you know heat the uh, reactor uh, to 400 degrees celsius what these new research suggests is to use solar energy 
to integrate uh, this uh, solar energy to produce this heat which can be used to liquefaction uh, used to perform the liquefaction process then uh, other uh, uh, kind of integrations are you know integrating anaerobic digestion with liquefaction so if there are any uh, this uh, anaerobic digestion plus liquefaction is usually performed for biomass feedstocks so if we have any uh, biomass which has high uh, which has a high potential for digestion to produce uh, something like alcohols or uh, you know acids and so on so usually what they do is they uh, first perform the digestion process and whatever slurry is remaining after the digestion process they try to liquefy that uh, digested to uh, further add value to this process so integrating uh, digestion process with liquefaction is also a new area of our research that is uh, emerging and final uh, list of challenge is the environmental challenge so to uh, you know we have to still uh, confirm how much uh, co2 or carbon footprint uh, that is being uh, uh, you know uh, released um, when we do a direct liquefaction of coal so the amount of carbon dioxide that is being generated to uh, produce these liquids have to be taken into account as well as uh, other uh, pollutants and uh, uh, you know in some cases uh, we use water so if we are uh, using steam for any of our process or uh, water can be used for something like uh, so i uh, mentioned briefly about this process also hydrothermal liquefaction so basically we'll be using water to liquefy uh, our uh, feedstock so in all these cases the amount of water that is being used uh, has also uh, is also uh, you know we also need that to be taken into account in order to establish uh, you know the sustainability aspect of uh, direct liquefaction process so just a few more uh, questions uh, with regards to this uh, process so syngas conversion efficiency of a combined uh, cycle gas turbine power plant may be uh, uh, i think uh, yeah uh, it was up to uh, 60 so uh, for a single cycle it was i think 30 to 40 and for a yeah and for combined cycle it was up to 6 um which statement is not true about uh, advantages of uh, gasification so we'll just yeah reduce co2 uh actually the answer i think is none of these because uh, one of the uh, uh, so uh, if i remember correctly reduced co2 emissions was an advantage of gasification uh, we were uh, it is also said that we can uh, accurately uh, control the combustion efficient uh, combustion temperature and pressure and we can also achieve high thermal efficiency in gasification so i think uh, none of these is the right answer here which catalyst is uh, used in uh, ctsl process yes exactly so nickel molybdenum and alumina uh, is the catalyst used for uh, ctsl process yeah i think uh, we uh, came to the end of uh, today's session so uh, what i'll make uh, so you wanted it that derivation for uh, this uh, or uh, ah yes yes okay nice yes.